It's been nearly one year since Justice Brett, uh, Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation was rocked by allegations of misconduct. Back then, his accuser claimed it was her civic duty to come forward. Remember this? I am here because I believe it is my civic duty to tell you what happened to me. Nice girl, but about as sharp as a sack of wet mice. Well, now, newly uncovered video of her lawyer is raising some questions about that testimony. He will always have an asterisk next to his name. When he takes a scalpel to Roe v. Wade, we will know who he is. That woman's as cold as a nudist on an iceberg. We'll know who he is. We know his character, and we know what motivates him, and that is important. It is important that we know, and that was part of what motivated Christine, and that was part of what motivated Christine. Meanwhile, I have to ask this question. Has the news media come out of this controversy looking better or worse? I, don't, I see, I don't think this boy's got all his marbles. Because I'm pretty sure we don't look better. Uh, the narrative from Trump world is that the media worked with the Dems to take Kavanaugh down. And it contradicts what you just showed that Christine Blavie, Blasey Ford was saying this was all about her civic duty. Mm -hmm. It raises a lot of questions uh, regarding what was the actual motivation. And there's a lot of concern that newsrooms have lowered their standards uh, in pursuit of this story. Nutty as a fruitcake. Let's talk about all of it and where we go from here with former CNN anchor Frank Sesno. He's the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University. Also in D.C., Olivia Nuzzi, the Washington correspondent for New York Magazine. She reminds me of Paul Revere's ride, a little light in a belfry. And here with me in New York, CNN analyst and Washington bureau chief for American Urban Radio Networks, April Ryan. Gail reminds me of the highway between Fort Worth and Dallas. No curves. Olivia, just a simple question. What does it feel like in Washington today? Well, emotions are very high. Um, obviously, those who opposed Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation are very upset. This is not the outcome that they wanted. Um, and as uh, your colleague Caitlin Collins noted earlier, the, but the White House is looking at this as a tremendous success. Like this week has, has gone exactly as planned. Uh, Donald Trump is, is very high on uh, Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation, um, which is, of course, very unusual when you think about it. I mean, to have your Supreme Court nominee under investigation um, at a, a very fraught hearing like he was. Meanwhile, the New York Times has this uh, investigation into Donald Trump's claims about his wealth this week. Uh, under any nor normal circumstance, this would not be a positive week for the White House. Um, but by today's standards, as the White House looks at it, they, they're very happy with the outcome. And I think that the fact that emotions are so high on the left from those who oppose Judge Kavanaugh, um, they view that as a good thing. They think that it will be energizing the base going into the midterms. I don't know if I think that's true. Oh, that woman got a mouth like an outboard motor all the time. Uh, we have a, a very long time by political standards until that point. A lot right. can happen. Um, yeah. And I, I think it would be a mistake for any side to view this as a as something that's going to lead to a desired outcome in the midterm elections or in, certainly in 2020. Uh, this uh, controversy involving Kavanaugh only transpired because of the press, uh, because of the Washington Post story about Ford and then the New Yorker story about Deborah Ramirez. There's been so much reporting and frankly, Frank says no, some misreporting. Uh, do you think uh, the, the, the press is coming out of this looking weaker? Uh, do you think uh, the, the, the press is coming out of this looking weaker? His muscles are as soggy as a used tea bag. Uh, because many people feel that the press chose a side through this? Yes. Uh, certainly that's the way it's going to look to um, Trump supporters and to people who've been questioning the media's uh, bias and their ability to report straight for a long time. Because people on the left have said that Justice Gorsuch sits in a stolen seat that belonged to Merrick Garland, President Obama's nominee, mm -hmm. and now they're trying to put an asterisk next to Justice Kavanaugh's name. And we know where the public trust numbers are um, for the press generally, and it's somewhere down below the basement. <laughs> Um, look, the fact of the matter is that by any reasonable measure, this has been an extraordinary week for this president. Forget the Russia investigation, forget the tax story, forget all the rest. Uh, trade deal with Mexico and Canada, unemployment numbers that haven't been this low since 1969, and following through on what he said 
which was to remake the Supreme Court and a triumph with Kavanaugh himself. The coverage has been unrelentingly negative, in many cases deserved. That's the kind of coverage that a president, any president gets. Mm -hmm. But what the public and what the White House um, come away from this with is, uh, you know, some, some fair territory to wag their fingers and say, I told you so. Even Joe Scarborough goes on the air and says the mainstream media were unfair toward the president. So there's going to be some very serious thinking now. And as the country is, as you pointed out, as divided, more divided than it's ever been coming out of this Kavanaugh thing around this stuff, um, I think the challenge grows even greater for the media to figure out where it's going and how it's going to try to find some balance in all of this. You hear something that Sarah Fagan said on MSNBC the other day. She said that 20 years ago, some of these allegations, like the Ramirez story in The New Yorker, wouldn't have even been published. Here's what she said. You know, 20 years ago, no major news publication would have even published those second allegations, um, her, the second allegation or the third al allegation. And so we are now in a, in a different place in this country. Frank, is that true? That boy's about as sharp as a bowling ball. Absolutely. Absolutely. When I, I was bureau chief here at, at, you know, at CNN during the Lewinsky things. We had a whole series of, of procedures to make sure that hearsay didn't get on the air and that we were going to confirm it ourselves before we put it on the air. That's completely been overtaken by events now with social media. But what is confirming and other mean? What is confirming me what? nowadays <clears throat> if it's an on the record accusation, but without a lot of corroborating evidence? Some corroborating evidence, multiple sources. Somebody doesn't just step forward, or if they step forward, so Ford had some corroborating evidence. She had her uh, test, you know, her her, her therapy. She had do documentable places where she raised this, how she remembered it, whether it's accurate. They're both 100% in their recollections. Remember when they testified? That's another matter. We would have reported that, but some of these other things, I agree, we would not have reported in in, in the old days. I don't know. Stand up, boy. You're tripping over your own feet. Yeah, let me take through some of the other examples. We mentioned the New Yorker story. That's the Ramirez story. Uh, Ronan Farrow and Jane Mayer interviewed her on the record. Uh, but some people said, hey, the New Yorker shouldn't have published the story because there wasn't enough supporting evidence. Then there was that New York Times report about a bar fight in 1985. It was co-written by magazine staff writer Emily Basilton. Uh, Basilton, even though she opposed Kavanaugh, in her capacity as a Yale Law School fellow. So the Times came out and said, look, we stand by the story, but we should not have sent her there to report on it. This boy's making more noise than a couple of skeletons throwing a fit on a tin roof. Uh, even though it was convenient because she was in New Haven, Connecticut, she got the court filings. We shouldn't have had her name on the story. So that was another controversy. And then MSNBC uh, snagged an interview with Julie Swetnick. That's the Kavanaugh accuser uh, who was represented by Michael Avenatti. This interview, you know, NBC didn't kind of know what to do with it. They tried to verify her claims. They couldn't. They aired some of it on MSNBC. But again, this is another example of uh, in a prior generation, maybe the interview wouldn't have aired at all. Um, Olivia, your thoughts in then April? I don't know about that. I, I, I don't know about holding up the, uh, the Clinton impeachment era uh, as a way of pushing back on the idea that, um, that we would not have published these things in, in another time. Uh, these women were on the record. Whether or not you believe their accounts, I mean, that is sort of up to the reader, up to the viewer, in my view. And if you'd stop all your arguing and join, you'd see my side of it. Yep, yep, yep. Keep that mouth flapping and do no listening. Um, I, I think that the New Yorker story was pretty carefully written. There were a lot of caveats in there. Um, but I, I do think that when you have somebody who's on the record, that really changes the calculation. Uh, and then quite it becomes a bit. about proportionality, right? How much attention right. do we give these I think on the, the issue, allegations? I think the issue is in part that, you know, on the internet, everything looks about the same size. Look, sister, is any of this filtering through that little blue bonnet of yours? Um, there's not really any way to tell uh, what's the big story, what's the big credible story, and what's something that should be paid less attention to. Um, but I think that the press was trying, in a, in a very hurried way, to do serious reporting, to do serious reporting. That dog, I say that dog, strictly G.I. Gibber an idiot, that is.